Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we continue... I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Joe Foster. He has a channel called Grow It, Build It, YouTube. Very informational, very detailed videos, how to set up a garden, how to, you know, compost, how to grow different seeds. I mean, everything it sounds like someone would need to get their own, you know, garden going in their yard and uh, set it up and tend to it, et cetera. So, Joe, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, if you would, tell me a bit about your background. Were you, were you born growing vegetables or how did you start into this? We had a garden when I was growing up and I did work at a garden center, like a mom and pop shop in high school, but I really didn't get into gardening too much until around 10 years ago, you know, heavily anyways, first with flowers and then with vegetables. And it was hiking in Shenandoah with some buddies, and we were between Little Stony Man and Stony Man, came around a corner, and it was like an out-of-body experience. There was like a thousand butterflies, big ones, they were large swallowtails that were landing on me, on everyone else, all around us. We were just swarmed by them. And I, just, yeah. I thought, man, I'd like to create something like this at home, you know? So I went about learning how to do that, and that's kind of where the whole idea of our channel and website got started but we also you know figured out that well we're pretty good at growing vegetables and taking a piece of suburbia and turning it into a fertile garden and you know we can show people how to do that in a very simple understandable way that works you know and it doesn't require much money really i mean we're kind of set around doing this the most frugal way possible so which should be attractive to people as well i would think so uh, I mean, you mentioned composting. I mean, pretty much all of this was kind of self-taught. You know, you'd read some here, and but you'd really do a lot of experimentation on your own. You know, I right. would. And, you know, there's a few places where we innovated, which, you know, people respect that. And like you said, our channel is more informational. It's not entertainment. So the videos we do are meant to instruct, get right to the point. You know, it's, it's not about my personality uh, or anything like that. It's, it's just trying to get people the information that they want. Uh, you know, whatever the title of the video is, that's what it's going to contain. Right, I understand. So what happened? What was? What did you do over the years? And you know, what did you try first and next and next? And what does it look like today? Well, I mean, we've been doing this uh, at a little townhouse. which had a, a postage stamp size of a backyard with a little native plant flower garden and just a few vegetable plants. And about six years ago, we purchased a house that has it's on a half acre and we set about building, well, landscaping it and building a vegetable garden. And 
it was absolutely horrible. We're in Pennsylvania. We're actually like near the end of the Blue Ridge Mountains. So it's rocky, but yet overcompacted from the, the neighborhood they built 20 some years ago. And to dig a hole in that, you had to jump on the shovel. And I, I did actually break a couple of tools <laughs> uh, the first year uh, gardening, just because I'm trying to get rocks out and everything else. But over the years, we, uh, you know, we learned how taught ourselves how to compost and got very good at that. And also found a, the probably the easiest way to massively improve your soil in the shortest amount of time for no money. And that is to apply thick layers of leaf mulch, which has done amazing things for our garden soil, night and day difference. And that's basically where, where we are today. I mean, we're right now are, we've probably got six to eight inches of the softest black topsoil back there that you could have. We have virtually no weeds in our garden. Not that we're really pulling them. It's your goal. Well, have fresh vegetables during the summertime and preserve some for the wintertime, which is what we're doing. This year, we're kind of going harder towards tomatoes to try to can a bunch of those. But we've you know, been preserving zucchinis, peppers, and we've done some tomatoes just by freezing them, which is okay. We're not trying to do full-on homesteading. You know, We're more hobbyist gardeners, more general gardeners. So mm. um, it's we're not trying to be self-sufficient on this little piece of property. We've got some fruit trees we've planted as well, but, you know, those are years away from producing. Well, how much of your, your food intake are you getting from your garden, like percentage-wise? I'd say uh, right now, not much, probably 5% maybe. As the season goes on, though, I mean, it'll it'll be a little more substantial in terms of vegetables. You know, when it comes to fresh vegetables, we'll get most of them from our vegetable garden as we are harvesting. And then uh, for what we can preserve this year, but I mean, I would say probably 50 to 75% of our vegetables from within a week or two until November will probably be from us. I mean, we, yeah, we grow lettuce and all, you know, the simple stuff, but a lot of the vegetables you think of with a vegetable garden don't really start coming on until July, August, September, October, around here anyways. Right, but you said you're canning them and storing them, so they have from a year that That's, you could eat, or by the time winter's over, they're all eaten through. Well, the canning of tomatoes is going to be a first for us this year. Actually, we've never, I've never done that before, so that's kind of the next learning experience with that. We have blanched zucchini. It's not mass quantities. We're not doing the homesteading thing, but we're learning how to do some preservation. The only item that I preserve a lot of quantity of for my own personal use, really, is I smoke jalapeno peppers on my grill and dry them out and then I get to use those all year as a spice basically for eggs omelets and soups or whatever I feel like putting them on <laughs> but uh well, that's cool. yeah when you said smoke and you pause for a half second I thought you're gonna say like you the only thing you you, you have you around is something else you smoke uh, you're not really smoking them you're just no. smoking them for flavor and then eating them yeah exactly I just have a basic black Weber charcoal grill and smoke meat on there, smoke peppers on there. You know, I mean, grilled vegetables is delicious. Smoked vegetables is delicious. It's about the best spice you can add to chili, you know, and anything from anything Mexican or anything like that. Do you grow microgreens or anything? Or, again, this is more like just a hobby that's seasonal that you enjoy? Hobby that's seasonal that I enjoy. We're just starting to uh, test the waters with doing larger amounts of preservation this year. So we've got a lot of tomato plants back there that are fairly loaded and fairly large right now, but they're all green yet. But uh, I'm hoping to, ideally, I want to be able to not buy any tomato sauce for the next year. I mean, that's kind of my goal. Okay. I don't, I don't know cool. if I'll make it, but we'll see. Well, it's a nice, small, like, bite-sized, you know, pun intended goal. Instead yeah. of just be like, oh, we're going to be 100% self-sufficient <laughs> type thing, you know? That's a huge yeah. jump, it sounds like. Well, yeah. I mean, that's... Uh, you know, that's a lot to learn, you know, in a short period of time. And I mean, this is a hobby. I mean, I do have a regular full-time job outside of this. So go ahead. Yeah, now that you're doing this, though, um, would it take for someone to be, you know, to grow all their own food? Is it like a Herculean effort or is it a lot of effort plus a lot of learning? Like you've got some insights into it because you're doing a little bit of it. So what do you see now with your, your new eyes? Honestly, I think it's really how much effort you'd put into it. If you rotate crops, do all the right things for composting and, you know, adding fertile fertility back into your soil. I mean, if, if you have a massive garden, you can grow a heck of a lot of food and preserve it all. I have an uncle back where I'm from who does that, actually. Uh, I mean, and, and he keeps years worth of stock. 
So he can still go get a, a can of or a jar of green beans that he can two years ago, which, you know, he will do because he rotates his stock and all that. But his garden is not that much larger than mine. And mine's, you know, 25 by uh, 20, basically. So not so large. But if, if somebody really wanted to put the effort into not buying vegetables from the grocery store, you could do pretty darn good on your own. There's no reason you couldn't uh, have a good supply of squash, zucchini, green beans, peas, uh, tomatoes, uh, beets, all of the above, you know, if you work at it. It's really a question of effort and how much you want to do. Uh, for me, it's a hobby, but I would like to try to do some canning because I have not actually done that yet. So um, like, with, like with a lot of this stuff, you learn as you go. Um, so what's your estimate on what, what size of a garden, if, you know, well-tended and things preserved could uh, support, you know, a person or a family, like any ballparks? Honestly, probably 40 by 40, 40 feet by 40 feet could probably do a small family of three or four, I, I would think. If it's well-tended and uh, you go through the different crop progressions, you know, you can, I mean, you can start a lot of crops uh, very early, Um in March or uh, April uh, around here, I'm in zone six, you know, there's no reason you can't get uh, the cold weather, uh, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, peas um, going then. And when you're pretty much done with those, you're on to the next set of crops into the same place you just grew the last. And you keep this going then through the midsummer and then switch back to cold weather crops again, say in August, that you can hopefully harvest by you know, mid-October or so. And have you found a way to grow stuff year-round, or is that impossible where you live? Without a greenhouse, that's pretty much impossible. I mean, it, it'll get down to uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit here. So uh, Ooh, okay. you have, have to be do, doing it inside. So our growing have season, you, er, the growing season is roughly, gardening season would be roughly from March through October is when you it's time to wrap it up usually, last harvest and all that. Have you thought about doing a, you know, like an in-ground greenhouse or, you know, greenhouse or hoop house so you can extend your growing season? Uh, no, I have not. It's, I'm not homesteading and, you know, probably 70% of our channel is not vegetable related even. So I've got an awful lot of other uh, plants and trees that I am uh, working on growing throughout the year, which is a, I mean, it, it's a significant amount of time on those. And then just filming. Oh, I mean, it takes forever. Yeah. What What are the reasons you uh, you grow non vegetable stuff? Like, I you know I had only watched some of the vegetable. Maybe I was hungry when I watched the videos, <laughs> and I focused on those. But yeah, you know, why do you grow stuff that's not directly um, you know, let's say for food? Or what are the reasons? Um, the big reason is just interest for myself. I mean, uh, it, native plants will attract um, vast quantities of wildlife. Uh, first in the form of insects, second in the form of birds to your yard and backyard. Uh, and it's incredibly beautiful and just interesting. It's like having your own little National Geographic channel in your backyard. You know, right now I've got three patches of a plant that is the absolute best attractor of monarch butterflies. I have probably four or five at, in my yard from dawn until dusk, like nonstop. They're always here. And it'll get even more. So it it's uh, It was interesting. It's kind of like that, I don't know what you call it, that experience I had at Shenandoah 10 years ago that really got me going on that. And the more you start looking at nature and the flowers and learning how they reproduce and what insects they attract and what can and cannot pollinate them and then what comes and eats those bugs, it's like a rabbit hole. You get curious about it and you just keep going deeper and deeper. And then when you learn how to identify the plants in the wild and germinate the seeds yourself, you know, you can basically do a massive amount of landscaping for little to no money, really. It's uh, So if you go into your backyard now, is it like a beautiful oasis with all kinds of plants and it is. creatures? Is it where you want it? It absolutely is. It's We have, we probably got about six or eight regular flower beds, but then we have the massive, we call it the micro prairie. It's about 50 feet by 15 feet, and it is solid flowers. I couldn't even begin to tell you how many species are back there, probably 20, 30 species in that area. I couldn't even tell you how many plants are there. There's a ton. And right now it's just, it's a wash with color and it's a wash with activity of bumblebees, hummingbirds, clear wing moths, every kind of and insects you've never dreamed of. Are it's back really there. cool. Yeah. That's awesome. So it's, it's like having your own have little you, 
private garden of Babylon, I guess. Yeah. Have you have you spoken to any um, like conservationists or people in the gardening world to have them come look and evaluate and give their feedback and stuff? Like, do you ever showcase what you do and have people come by? No, I haven't actually. It's. I mean, I look up uh, what plants are native here, and I try to grow them, and I try to match the conditions I have to the plant, and then design it so that they will be successful in their growing. And then I do a minimal amount of maintenance on that garden to make sure that I don't have one thing dominate everything else or shade out. You know, you don't want the tallest plant on the south side because it'll shade out everything up to the north, and you know, you could wind up with a monoculture then. But it really is like walking in to or walking along one of the prettiest meadows you've ever seen. You know, it's there's so many colors going off. There's so many bugs just going. You just hear buzzing constantly. And awesome. you just stand back there for a little bit, and you get hypnotized by it almost. It's just fun to watch. And well, it's really cool. Yeah. So what kind of feedback do you get on your YouTube channel? Like, what have you noticed? What kind of, uh, you know, native creature listeners have you attracted? And what do they like about your channel? They like the level of detail I put into a flower video because I try to answer every possible question you could have regarding it so that by the end of it, you're going to know what the plant is, what's good about it, why you should grow it, where it likes to grow, you know, sun, moisture, soil, how to do it from seed, how to save the seed. Is there anything else? Like, can you divide the plant? Could it grow in a container? What kind of wildlife does it attract? You know, what are other things that I've observed over the years growing it that could be helpful? You know, it's basically learn from me <laughs> because uh, most resources out there, you know, I don't know how many people have actually grown the stuff they wrote about. You know, it, it's wow. um, it's kind of, I, I mean, some people I, I know have, but a lot of times it's just the plant gets this tall. It likes this kind of sun, this soil, and it, it'll give some generalized characteristics about it. But I'll get down to the nitty gritty details, you know, with homegrown footage of it. You know, if they say a picture is worth a thousand words, a video has got to be worth 10 million words mm-hmm. because you Makes actually sense. see it. It's a much better resource than just simply having a brief, you know, index card almost that has some general information on the flower. Do you, you grow any medicinal plants in your yard or again, that's not yeah, your I, I do. I have not used them medicinally, but they, I have plenty of them actually. And I have uh, several species of Monarda, which is like a bee balm. And then I have an is hyssop, which is, that one actually is kind of cool. That was one of my more recent videos. You can actually eat the leaves of it, and it tastes exactly like black licorice. You could use it for yeah. flavoring, and it was oh, if, if you like black licorice. My, my wife would like it. I hate <laughs> it. Uh, but yeah, she um, would love it. Sure. The only plant I say that I grow that I in my yard that I actually haven't really eaten much from it because a single plant doesn't produce that much, especially how big it is, but it's something called the spice bush. And the spice bush is a shrub that can get up to, I don't know, 20 feet tall, and it you can eat the leaves to like to make a tea or the twigs, and it's real kind of peppery. And then it makes a red berry in about September, you know, late summer, early fall, and you can eat them like a snack, but they're not sweet at all. And then you can take those berries if you collect a bunch of them and dry them out, and they will – you can grind them up and like use them like a dry rub on chicken if you want, which I've done. And that tastes – in my opinion, it was a lot like lemon pepper seasoning. So – is there a reason to go do that as opposed to just using lemon pepper seasoning? Well, not if you don't know where to find the spice bush, but it's kind of fun to go out foraging in the wild, you know. So it's something that I'll well, do. Well, it's throughout. probably a lot healthier for you because you're growing it yourself and you can control the inputs. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, really, you got to forage it. My tree, my one specimen that I have right now is not large enough, but there is a game lands nearby, which it is legal to forage for your own personal use there where I can get bags of the stuff if I wanted to. There's just probably 10,000 plants there. <laughs> it's an interesting uh, little snack to have, though, too. When you're hiking in the woods, then, you know, you can just grab a handful of berries and, uh, you yeah. know, it, it, there's a nut inside. You can crunch it up just like any other nut. It's uh, a different kind of food for you. You know, that's, that's well, you forage. Season. Yeah, if you forage, you, you probably wouldn't be as afraid as someone that doesn't know. I remember years ago, I was walking with my wife, and there was an orange tree, and I, I bit into one. I didn't realize it was a decorative orange. Aha. Uh-huh. And it, it numbed my whole mouth for like three days. It was <laughs> oh. full of alkaloids. It was awful. And I didn't know. Now I know really well. Yeah. I need decorative orange. Yeah. I mean, there's a handful of things that I'll forage. Uh, black raspberries, which are just going out of season now. 
they have a very short shelf life, kind of have to eat or freeze them in 48 hours. But I finally found some good pawpaw patches that I can go get. It's kind of like a trendy fruit right now, but it, it's kind of like a if you took a banana and crossed it with a mango, that's what it tastes like. But they don't have a very long shelf life once they come off the tree, which means you can't really buy them commercially. You can get them at farmer's markets from people that grow them or know where to forage them, but that's about it. So it's kind of like when you go out there doing that, it's like Easter egg hunting for adults. But I've grown a few trees from seeds that I saved and planted those, you know, around my perimeter of my property. And I have a couple other trees that I had purchased not long after we moved here. So I'm hoping to have my own little pawpaw patch here, you know, and I don't know, hopefully in a few years I can start getting a few at least. But it's fun stuff, really. There's a, I really like seeing what you can get out of nature. I love learning about plant, everything to know about the plant. because there are a lot of medicinal plants out there, a lot of edible plants out there that most people just do not know about. And being able to safely identify them helps you in several ways. Number one, if you want to eat them, you can. Number two, if they're poisonous and could kill you, you know. <laughs> and, right. uh, exactly. That's what I mean. You, yeah. You'll be safer going out with your knowledge than someone that doesn't know because you'll be like, oh, that's the wild blah, blah, blah. You can eat it. I'll stay away from that one. It'll kill you. You know, my parents live on a farm out in the Midwest, and they, uh, they've they got a guy who's been contracting to come make hay on their land. And riding around with my dad, I'm pointing out, hey, that and that and that will kill his horses, you know, if he eats the hay, yeah. if they eat the hay. You know, so he tells the guy, and he comes out and sprays the poisonous plants, and, you know, that's which is what he has to do. I mean, they're aggressive plants, and they're all over here, but... Uh, it's weird. It's stuff like that, though. If It's kind of like you don't know what you don't know. It's kind of like you biting the decorative orange. You know, if somebody did decide they were going to homestead and they bought a cow and you know, they're milking the cow and it eats this plant I'm speaking of now, which I haven't said, which is white snake root, the milk is now poisoned and it can kill you. But you're not going to know that. You're not necessarily going to taste that. You know, but allegedly that's what killed Abraham Lincoln's mother, I guess, when he was a boy. Was she, oh, think, really? Wow. Yeah. So it, it's a prolific, widespread, beautiful plant, but extraordinarily toxic. It's Very interesting. Yeah. But, uh, so do you use like fertilizers and do you spray pesticides and all that, or do you try to keep everything organic? Like how does that part of it work for you? The only thing that I spray around my, uh, around my flowers or my vegetables is liquid fence. And I only do the liquid fence for the ones that are exposed to uh, deer. Um, you know where I can, and that's a uh, the main ingredient of that is basically like concentrated rotten eggs and garlic. It's just it makes everything smell bad, but it does it is water soluble. It does wash off. So if you did get some on one of your tomatoes, you can you know it, it should come off when you rinse it off. But uh, I don't use any other fertilizers or anything. I use a very very heavy layer of leaf mulch in the fall, and I also use my own compost that I apply a layer in the fall and then when I'm transplanting in the spring or planting seeds, I always amend with some of my compost and that's it. I, I have not used a synthetic fertilizer probably since 2017. So how much of trying to save external inputs have you been doing and which ones have you been able to save a lot of and other ones not as much? Like do you retain rainwater? Do you have to buy any fertilizer, compost, et cetera? I don't buy any compost. I don't buy any fertilizer. I have to buy my deer repellent is the only thing. It's deer and rabbit repellent. Uh, I say liquid fence. Uh, I should have clarified that. Um, there's a lot of deer repellents out there. A lot of people have ones that work. This is one that I've been using for a long time that works, but that's the only thing I would actually say I'd buy. For water, I have a well and... If I'm if I've got you know four or five days of very hot temperatures, you know I may water my vegetable gardens or other places if I think it needs it. But generally, I I don't have to, uh, especially with the vegetable garden. When you have a thick layer of leaf mulch, I mean that really helps retain the moisture down below. You know you you can have very hot days. You can peel back some of the leaf mulch and just stab your hand into the soil and it's moist. You know it, it's I, I can't. Oh, that's I, great. Yeah. So it, I guess it keeps the uh, soil temperature way down, and again, it retains moisture as well. Yeah. Um, now, the soil temperature being down is not always a good thing, though, especially when it comes to, like, peppers and tomatoes because they need it hot before they really take off. But, uh, but, but yes, retaining the moisture is the key. Uh, you know, it's, it's basically the leaf mulch and the compost is just adding organic matter to your 
inorganic soil or, you know, your non-fertile soil. And the addition to that organic matter brings in microorganisms plus nutrients. And the microorganisms and the uh, mycelium from that will allow the plants to actually uh, get draw nutrients from the soil. So it's kind of a symbiotic relationship between them. We don't till. We, uh, I mean, we keep it about as simple as we can, and we have very good results. And, I mean, nature is a complex system. If you have a system that works very, very well and it makes sense, you should not be changing it up, you know. It's kind of like if it's not broke, don't fix it. But we've, been, we've had repeat, repetitive years of doing this with very good success. You could always, there could be a new trend that comes up tomorrow. I'm not going to necessarily change anything to go do that just because uh, I know what works, <laughs> you know, and, and unless I can see a reason why I should have a big improvement changing my methods, I'm not going you know, if I don't have a problem to solve, I shouldn't. I wish, I wish the governments of the world would have the same philosophy, <laughs> but unfortunately not. Or if they just had the first do no harm philosophy, that would be pretty good too. I mean, yeah, that too. Yeah. 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 But, uh, hmm. yeah, it's, uh, you know, a lot of times we cause our own problems by uh, messing with stuff when we should just leave it alone. But, again, I mean, everything I show on the, the vegetable side, well, everything I show on my YouTube channel is what I do. So it, there's not you know, hidden mysteries that I'm not showing. It, it, this is what, what you see is what you get. And I try to very stay very interactive with people even today, you know, with old videos. I, I pretty much answer every single comment if it's a question. That's and, great. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I've been in their position, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you can get a little guidance and you have a very specific question and I can answer it, I will. And if I can't, I tell you I can't. Uh, one question that I get asked a lot is about manure, and I've never used it. I tell them what I know, but I tell them to go to the USDA website to see the, the guidelines on temperature, you know, for compost, for example, so that they can see what they're supposed to do to make sure that they can safely compost with manure, you know, which can obviously have diseases and such in it. I mean, right. I, well, I was going to ask you, what are, what are some of the top frustrations or the questions that you see over and over and over from your YouTube um, I can't really say that they're frustrating to me uh, because they're actually in my compost video, which is you know by far my most successful video. It, it's something I never addressed, so I, I can't really fault them. Usually, it's you know what do you do for the rain, and my answer is well nothing. I don't cover my piles ever. They're out there exposed to everything, and people think that if they do that, they're going to get too wet and it's going to be a problem. And my answer is well look, I, I don't cover them. You saw me make a pile over the course of sixty days. You saw all the ingredients that went into this pile. Um, it works, you know, this method works, and you're not really going to be losing nutrients. I mean, there's a lot of people who will say that if it gets rained on, everything's going to leach out the bottom and you're going to lose out. Well, maybe, but my plants look pretty good, you know. So I'm, I think I'm doing something right. But what It'll people, be interesting if, if someone did a compost pile deliberately uphill and almost adjacent to their garden. So if it did rain and it did mm -hmm. leach, it's okay. We'll go right into the garden. Uh, you know, and that you could absolutely do that. And I actually did do a compost pile inside my garden once. But what I've learned is even when I get a lot of heavy rain, a compost pile has an amazing ability to absorb a heck of a lot of water, more than people think. If you have a pile that is, you know, three feet tall, you figure that's a, a hemisphere, basically, half a, half a ball, you know, spherical. Think about putting an inch of rain. Well, an inch of rain, you know, that, that's a lot of rain that's not going to go all the way through your pile. It's not necessarily going to push moisture down through the bottom. You know, it's most likely that your pile is starting to dry out a little bit and the rain helps it. You know, every so often we get the tail end of a hurricane up here where we'll get, you know, 10 inches of rain, and that's a different story. When that happens, you just have to go turn your pile. If it heats back up, great, no problem. If it doesn't heat back up, your, your pile is probably pretty well decomposed, and you should just leave it and let it, you know, finish off cold composting with worms helping you out. Nature's got this figured out better than we do. We just have to apply the right ingredients and then just manage the pile, manage the moisture level a little bit, um, and keep it aerated. And we will have compost in due time. Even if you never turn your pile once, in a year you're going to have compost. You will. It, you know, stuff decomposes 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, whether we want it to or not. You know, we're, with composting, we're just accelerating the process a bit so that we can use the material sooner. 
Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I didn't mean that your material is frustrating to people, but what are some of the frustrations that people have where they, oh. you know, like what kind of advice do they need that you see is pretty typical to help people? The biggest frustrations that people have is, actually, most of the time I just get compliments on it uh, because I, I took a complex topic and I, I simplified it in a way that people could understand. But um, I guess the, uh, the biggest frustrations people have is they overthink composting. Um, they, they hear a lot about CN ratios and making sure it's exactly balanced right. And if it's not balanced right, you did something wrong. And, you know, they get very confused because they'll watch one video, they'll watch another video, they'll read a different article. And in the end, they're not sure what's right and what's wrong. You know, my philosophy that I bring to it is you've got four basic ingredients, apply those in sufficient quantity, you know, keep it wet, keep it aerated, and just, you know, here's what I have learned and what you can do. And um, I, I hear from people very frequently um, that I applied your method. My first time my compost pile has ever gotten hot. Oh, my God, this was great. Your method actually worked. You know, they're they're generally very happy. You know, are they always going to have the same results as me? No, because everyone's pile is going to be a little different, little, you know, a little different ingredient makeup. Maybe they manage it differently. But the main thing is that they're out there doing it finally, and they're actually gaining experience, and they're learning how to make adjustments to make it work right for them. It's uh, the biggest frustration people have had with composting, without a doubt, is that it's the topic has been overcomplicated, made way too complicated, more than it needs to be. So, Okay. Um you know, I've been seeing in the news, and I'm sure a lot of people have been seeing that there may be massive food shortages and other yeah. problems, um, you know, supply chain issues, et cetera. What's your recommendation for people that want to dip their toe in, you know, not to go crazy and try to replicate everything and, you know, sure. go off the grid completely, but... Uh, yeah. Oh, it's okay. I said, what's the recommendation yeah, you... to dip their toe? Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, re I'll revise this. Okay. Um, how, do you, how do you suggest someone dips their toe in and gets started you know, without going crazy and, you know, doing too mm -hmm. much work and then saying, I hate this and giving up. <laughs> yeah. You don't want people to get frustrated. That's for sure. Um, the best advice I would give is to smart, st sm start small, start manageable. Pick out a few vegetables that you really enjoy and research what you need to do to grow those. And then the, the real secret to having a green thumb, it, it, it's really not a big mystery. Again, most people overcomplicate gardening, but Every plant has certain conditions that it likes to grow in. You need to find those for the vegetable you want to grow, and then you need to match that. So it's going to need to have full sun, It's going to, usually. It's going to need to have well-draining soil, which I show you how to do that, or test that anyways. And those are really the two biggest ones. You know, it, it's uh, don't, don't decide, okay, this year I'm going to grow 100% of my food. I'm going to not buy one vegetable from the store. Don't do that. You you need to you need to learn how to crawl before you can walk, before you can run, uh, before you can do somersaults. I mean, it's uh, start small, pick vegetables you really like to eat, and then research those very specifically from a, a high level on the growing conditions, and then match those. And also know that even if you don't have a garden built in ground. There's nothing saying you can't just do grow bags or five-gallon buckets with holes drilled in them filled with potting soil. You can grow your vegetables in that. You know, you're not going to have massive yields, but you're going to have good yields uh, to, to start out. You know, people need to learn um, how easy it is to grow things first and foremost before they just decide I'm going off grid, like you said. You know, like like many people say, um, it's. Uh, you know, just pick a few vegetables and start growing them. You could even still start this year even, believe it or not. Well, you, you could start this year still with uh, certain vegetables for sure. Um, but uh, that would be my okay. advice. Where, where, do, where can people go to see, um, based on the time of year they start this and what zone they're in or where they live, what, um, what they can grow and what they can't grow that would work for them? The, I actually don't have a resource on this on my own website. Uh, I should probably get on that. But uh, the USDA is an excellent resource for most of this information. Uh, they are the ones who have determined the plant hardiness zones. And then based on that, there is a, there's a whole lot of resources out there for what you can plant when based on where you live. If you just search that, you will find calendars galore um, that are you know pretty accurate. It's uh, basically 
your your hardiness zone is essentially a, a term to decide how long your growing season in is, whether it starts in March and ends in October or starts in January and ends in November, you know. If you're way down south, for example, you know, Florida, they can garden all year, I'm pretty sure. And same with Southern California, I think. Yeah, um, like I'm in, I'm in Texas and Austin, so I'm sure yeah. a lot of the year here. But then again, it's so hot, everything's been frying lately. That, and that's something to consider. I, um, you know, the container gardening idea for at least for if, if you're just jumping off is not a bad idea to get a couple tomato plants. You know, you can get some fresh tomatoes and you can do Zucchini is fairly easy, although that needs a little bit more room, I guess. But you can have tomatoes easily. Uh, herb gardens are extremely easy to just grow in small pots. Uh, it's uh, lettuce you can grow in, you know, 10-inch pots, 10-inch by 10-inch pots, no problem. I've grew plenty of romaine and general lettuce in that, uh, which is more of a cold-weather crop. But, you know, there, there's so many vegetables out there. You just, If you're just getting started and you don't think you want to take the plunge and actually build a garden in your yard, start small, find some vegetables that are good for the containers that you want to eat, and go there. Um, and from there, you can start to decide, um, okay, how big of a garden do I actually need? How many vegetables do I want? How much time am I going to put into this? Um, and a lot of my videos on, like, how to start a vegetable garden are really based around that. Where would you put a garden? What factors should you consider? How big does it need to be? And I try to answer a lot of those questions. You know, my garden is a long ways from my house, which is somewhat unique because if I need to water my garden, I have to run a hose a long ways and sprinkle it with a sprinkler. But that's just how I made the best of my situation. Um, other people certainly would probably have a better opportunity to keep their garden closer to their house so they could water it easier if they needed to, for example. But the key thing is make sure you're putting that garden in a location that is going to get blasted with sun as long as possible. Um, that's what makes the vegetables grow, basically, is sun, sun, sun. Now, I understand in Texas, you guys, are, it sounds like you're under some kind of a drought, which that that's another wrinkle you have to deal with. You know, how do you deal with that? Um, you know, where I live, water's not an issue. I have a well. I don't have to pay anyone for my water, just a little electricity to run the pump, you know. Um, in California, that's a much bigger thing where you'd probably want to have an institute of rain barrel or some kind of collection system if you're allowed to and even. But, yeah, yeah. Sorry exactly. if I'm overwhelming you with information, but it's. Uh, <laughs> no, it's fine. These it's, aren't always the good. simplest questions. It's okay. No, you're, yeah. you're giving a lot of great info. I mean, that, there's tons more to be had, but, yeah, it's a good start. Have you ever uh, sold anything that you've grown or uh, addressed that issue? Of I've never sold vegetables I've grown. I've given lots away, but I have sold trees and flowers that I grow um, that on the side. And that's been somewhat profitable, actually. I mean, it's not my main goal always, but you start growing things on your own from seed, you have trouble killing plants. <laughs> so you always pot them up, and then eventually I figured, well, maybe I could just put some of these on uh, Facebook Marketplace, and I did, and sold a number of plants the last few years, trees especially. People are That's cool. people like to get cheap trees. So it's, uh, you know, you go to a nursery, you're usually spending quite a bit of money for, uh, you know, even a one-foot tree, whereas I'll sell it to you for 10 bucks, <laughs> you know, and it's local ecotype, which is even better. So it's local ecotype means it's from your area. It's evolved in your right. area. It's perfect for your area. Whereas if you, uh, other trees are, uh, or plants sometimes are zone specific. So if you take a, something that maybe evolved in the south and you sell it up north, maybe it can't survive the winter up north. You know, I mean, that does happen with certain ones. Or the blooming period of the, the plant will not be timed right when the pollinators are migrating through the area. I mean, that's another factor that is often, can be, uh, okay. you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it, like I said, nature is complex. It's not, <laughs> it's not simple. Um, so, uh, but, but for vegetables though, I really got to say, start small, especially if you're starting now, when you're in the, the height of summer, you can still do stuff, especially in Texas, I'm sure. But, you know, don't bite off more than you can chew. It's very easy for someone to get garden fever, if you will, and decide they're going to build a massive garden and grow so much food. And then they just find out it's too much work for them and they don't know what to do all the time. And it's, you know, you don't want to get behind, so to speak. It's that, that's not a fun position to be in ever. 
but uh yeah that makes sense for the future what do you want to do what's your goals over the next couple of years um well i'm in continue expanding our flower gardens and trying to uh beat back some invasive plants that are behind our house and restore that to at least somewhat more native status and then for the vegetable garden if we have a lot of success canning uh, we've discussed probably doubling the size of our garden not ready to pull the trigger on that yet but uh you know we'll just if we are able to preserve a lot of our food and we like the idea of doing that and if there's more and more supply and change shortages then that'll probably make that decision easier but you know it's kind of uh adapt to the situation if you will <laughs> but ideally i'd like to grow a lot more of my food preserve a lot more of my food and you know just be more locally self-sufficient anyways i mean we've already decided i mean we do have a large freezer in the basement that you know we have filled with some game meat here and there but kind of emptying it out from store bought meat and we've already decided that we're probably going to be going local only for meat when it comes to beef and chicken and all that just because you know that you can find it where it's more grass fed less processed no antibiotics and not that i have a direct reason why those are bad i just know that they're not normal evolution <laughs> so it's kind of uh if there is a long term problem with that i would like to avoid it and if i can do it without spending too much more money then i should plus the money stays more local which is a good thing so that's excellent are there any grants that uh usda or anyone gives or like your local city may give if you make a a natural area or a wild native area on your your land i do not know about that for a residential something that's totally residential i can tell you that depending on where you if you have a farm there are several pro, usda grant programs crp and some other ones that i, I don't know the names of uh, crp would be you would not farm a field and maybe you had to plant certain trees in this you know acreage for 20 some years at the end of which you can cut the trees down and start farming it again but the government pays you to not farm and that's to provide habitat for wildlife there's other waterway grants for having filter strips so if you live along a creek or a river perhaps the last 10 year, 30 feet 10 yards to the river you will not farm it you will let it grow up as a hay field or meadow whatever grows grows and you're allowed to mow it maybe twice a year but that is to provide a filtration so that any farm runoff is captured rather than going into the waterway as well as providing local wildlife habitat so those definitely exist but that's more for farming i for a, your own backyard it's usually the opposite most people are fighting homeowners associations to have a more wild looking yard you know it help people mm, yeah yeah so it's the kind of the opposite i mean Historically Americans have had a green lawn with some very well manicured flower beds that contain plants that are native to Europe and Asia that nothing will eat which is you know from most people's perspective is a good thing uh however with those plants uh you know you're not really doing anything for the environment so one of the things we try to do is to show how you can make your front yard your front flower beds look good with native plants that actually will provide a benefit to bees butterflies host caterpillars and go from there you know i mean a lot of what we a lot of what i've done has been learning how to either make a native plant work well in a flower bed or finding ones that just do and you should have them which is kind of fun when you can actually tell someone like no this is a This is a plant that will actually help your local ecosystem uh, substantially and it's not going to be a problem for you and it's going to look good. And the best selling point when you're trying to convince someone of this is you tell them it's a plant that nobody else in the neighborhood will have because <laughs> they don't sell them in a garden center, you know, or not a regular one anyways. I mean, you can get okay. some pretty interesting looking flowers uh if you know what native ones are good to have. Yeah. Do you have any uh any courses or books that you're coming out with? calendars or anything like that? <laughs> no, but I've been asked about making a book multiple times by uh people, so that someday that could be in the works. Uh right now it's uh we try to put very detailed articles on our website as time permits and uh we try to do extremely detailed videos which are quite frankly as good as a course for that specific plant. But uh we have some other garden, you know, other topics that are related to this that I know you really can't get as good information as we provide anywhere else on the internet 
and that's on winter sowing seeds, which is um, it's really the best way to sow flower and tree seeds. But also we go through, okay, now that you have winter sown your seeds and they're all germinating, let's say you've got 10 plants growing in one pot, how can you safely separate them? And I show you what to do and how to do it uh, and give you some very high-level guidelines that are detailed enough where you can go do this, uh, that kind of stuff. And we've always got stuff in the pipeline. It's just if you watch some of my flower videos or anything else, you'll see that I will film for a long time before I actually make a video. <laughs> it's not just me going out in my yard and talking in front of a camera for 10 minutes. It's, I mean, some of my videos, I have footage that goes over two years to before I finally put it together. Wow. Jeez. What, yeah. Oh, well, that's great that you so, put in all this work and everything. Yeah. That, that's really good. Um, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, so people want to find out more about you and engage with you and your channel. They should go to YouTube and put in what to find you. Grow it, build it. Um, you can search that pretty much anywhere. You'll get, either get to our YouTube channel or our website, which obviously are interlinked, so you can go back and forth as needed. There is much more information on the website in terms of plant-related. You know, for the topics we have videos on, I mean, there's nothing better than a video to learn. I mean you'll learn so much more by seeing someone do something, you know, with their hands or see the plant in all four seasons, you know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and the website is what? Growitbuildit.com or what is it? Exactly. Yep. Just all one big long. Okay. Growitbuildit.com. Yep. Well, soon you have to have grow it, build it, harvest it, eat it, can it, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. You never know. It's uh, it's been a fun uh, project over the last few years. That's for, that's for sure. And, uh, I've enjoyed it. So, well, excellent, Joe. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast and sharing all your knowledge and making all these videos and being so careful and thoughtful about it. I, I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I've enjoyed it too. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.